Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring 21st century animism. My guest is Randy Kritkowski, who is an enrolled tribal member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. He is the founder of Ecologia, an international environmental organization that works on the planet's most extreme challenges, and formerly professor at Keystone College, research scholar at Middlebury College, and Erasmus Mundus Scholar at the Central European University in Budapest, and also Lund University in Sweden. He is the author of Without Reservation, Awakening to Native American Spirituality and the Ways of Our Ancestors. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Randy. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. I gather you grew up uh, with a conventional uh, Western American, Midwestern upbringing, middle class upbringing, uh, really not particularly related to your uh, native ancestry uh, that sort of awakened uh, in your life more recently. Yes, I, I, unlike a few of my relatives, had no connection to my ancestry other than a piece of paper and occasional mentions that, oh, we're Indians. Would you say that uh, your uh, ethos, your orientation to the world as you grew up was basically materialistic in the, in the way that so many Americans are? Oh, absolutely. I grew up in the 1950s in a Leave it to Beaver neighborhood um, in an all-white um, suburb of um, an upper New York State uh, city. And uh, I, I really didn't meet people other than people who looked just like me. I, I don't think I was even aware that they were out there until later in high school when a Japanese exchange student turned up. And that was the shocking first encounter with foreigners. Today, uh, I think you have a very different uh, world view uh, as a result of reconnecting with uh, the the world view of your Potawatomi ancestors. So you went through quite a radical transformation. Yes, I've never really found a word to adequately describe the degree and suddenness of the transformation. I, I use the word awareness because it's more palatable, palatable, but I have to say sometimes it felt more like an eruption of something in my consciousness, I mean, completely throwing me off balance and occasionally even making me feel, you know, physically dizzy. I'm so disoriented. In other words, something associated with your ancestry reached out to you. Absolutely, and I appreciate your understanding that because I, I did not seek, I did not conjure, um, I did not request this kind of connection. It just started happening, sleeping on this screened-in porch a few feet from where I sleep, and it grew in intensity and then accelerated like a rocket sled until you know I could feel the G-force of the the shift in consciousness and, you know, realized I'm, I'm on this for the ride and there's, there's no getting off. Um, not that I wanted to, but, you know, the, the force of gravity kind of held me in place. You were already established as, as a professional, I think, in sociology uh, when all of this came about. Well, I was, I, I taught at a small college for many years. I always felt very, very comfortable in that world. I liked intellectualizing things. It was uh, my comfort zone. But then some, something happened. And as I read your book, it, uh, uh, maybe it was the coyotes that reached out to you at first. That was one of the 
tipping points when I realized what I was becoming and beginning to realize who I was. And uh, that happened, as I describe in the book, when I was wrestling one evening with my family history and tried to escape it, only to come downstairs and have our local coy wolves circling around the house howling um, in the midwinter and and trying to I, I had the sense they were trying to tell me something and I think as I explained in the book I woke up in the middle of the night realizing that these hybrids of coyotes and wolves um, were basically telling me Randy you know you are of two worlds um, you are a hybrid like me and you are not a diminished Indian nor are you a diminished mainstream academic for the combination you are stronger in the in the making and I'm continuing to wrestle with the implications of this being dual spirited it, it is something that I think the mainstream even the most sympathetic mainstream just doesn't really get about what it means to be a Native American especially under the sort of countervailing influences of settler colonial culture You've never lived on the reservation, but you are a tribal member. Uh, how did that come about? Well, in my tribe, um, residential occupation on the reservation is not a requirement. It isn't in most places. Um, the United States allows tribes to decide what the requirements are. Some require a blood percentage or blood quantum. For my tribe, it's merely a matter of historical enrollment by one of your ancestors as of a certain date at the end of the 19th century. My grandparents did that. My grandparents kept it up. My mother kept it up. So I'm legally a, a tribal member. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I have to go back and spend time on the reservation. In fact, I'm several thousand miles away from the reservation. And as I'm beginning to realize I'm quite cut off from and separated from the spiritual and cultural support network that tribal life can bring. One of the interesting things that you point out in, in your book is here in North America, I think you report there might be roughly 7 million individuals who regard themselves as Native American, but maybe only half of those are actually uh, registered with different tribes. That is correct. And there are multiple reasons for it. And there are um, fraught arguments amongst Native Americans about how this came about. The number of people who self-identify as Native American grows with each census as it does in Canada. And one reason is that some people, um, famously Elizabeth Warren, you know, wish to identify with Native American heritage and like probably Elizabeth Warren, their families for various reasons disguised the fact that they had Native American ancestry. The reasons are very often quite, quite sad here in Vermont, which has this reputation for being highly tolerant. Um, we had a eugenics program at the turn of the 20th century, and the waspy Vermonters, white Vermonters, decided there were too darn many French Catholic Canadians and too many Native Americans going to dilute the bloodline of the wasps. So they started forcibly sterilizing both populations, and it took place at a school just a few miles from my house. Um, the program was actually noticed of all places, I cringe to say it, um, by the Germans who saw this as supporting, um, you know, their racial purity policies. So many Vermonters, the Abenaki, destroyed any family record of being Indian. It could get you in deep trouble. Similar problems occurred all across the United States. So we have a lot of people who never kept up the enrollment or if they did tore up the papers didn't talk about it in their family because it endangered their lives. What we're really talking about is a, a tradition on the one hand that is, uh, is deeply connected to nature, has basically a, um, 
a, a worldview, an ethos in, in which nature itself is alive, in which everything is animate, everything can speak to you, and at the same time is highly uh, persecuted and oppressed by the mainstream community in which you're embedded. Yes, and it, it began literally the year after Columbus's quote, unquote, I have to laugh when I say it, discovery of the Americas. Um, the, the Pope at the time issued something called the Doctrine of Discovery, which most Native Americans, I should say many Native Americans and most of the mainstream doesn't know about. He declared that the people who were inhabiting this half of the world were not true true people because they were barbarians and uncivilized. And if you read his doctrine of discovery, they had no right to own the land or their own possessions, all of which were given to Ferdinand and Isabella for getting rid of the Muslims, who had, the Moors who had occupied Spain. Ferdinand and Isabella had done this the year before. So when, when the English and the Spanish occupied these lands, they legally granted temporarily the right for Indians to remain on the land. But as the recent decision of the Supreme Court giving some tribal sovereignty back to various Oklahoma-based tribes, Gorsuch, who was applauded by the Native American community, made it very clear in his judgment that Congress can unilaterally at any moment um, suspend, um, reject the treaties they have signed with Native Americans. So we are still legally non-people. We are not, our, our, our interests, our sovereignty um, is not morally or legally um, binding on, on anyone. So we're romanticized, as you said, on the one hand, um, as people who have these magical and wonderful connections with nature. And on the other hand, you know, the legal institutions we have continue to marginalize us in unimaginable ways. And I imagine that this situation applies to indigenous people, not just in North America, but probably in South America and uh, many other parts of the world. Yes, this doctrine um, has been incorporated in the culture of many parts of the world, certainly the Western world. But I have to say that it's particularly insidious in our country. Um, in Latin America, I think there is more respect for indigenous people, and certainly in Canada, since their development of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, or excuse me, Truth and Reconciliation Policy, you know, they have begun to come to terms with how egregious these um, legal structures and cultural institutions were, and they are they are making amends and embracing the Native American community to a degree that we do not experience on, on this side of the border. Now, as a parapsychologist myself, uh, I'm well aware of the uh, oppression that uh, occurs to a entire scientific discipline that seems to recognize the uh, idea that the human mind is much more simply than the operation of the brain, that the uh, human consciousness has uh, the ability to reach out into the environment in, in many different ways that are unaccountable through uh, materialistic science. And, and that notion, even though it's been a, a, a uh, experimented and shown to be empirically valid for 138 years is still not recognized in academia. To me, it seems kind of parallel to uh, your situation uh, uh, as an advocate of a, a kind of uh, animistic worldview, which is almost entirely suppressed within academia. Yes, the academic friends and colleagues with whom I exchanged early drafts of my book immediately wrote to me or picked up the phone and said, oh, you have the wonderful gift of being able to write this. If I wrote it, my career is over, but let me tell you. And then they will pick up on one of my stories and say, I've had those kinds of experiences. I wish I could have more of those kinds of experiences. 
or I can't allow myself to have those kinds of experiences. Um, it's this problem of, of gating and, and putting up barriers to what I am convinced at this point is an ongoing relationship that we have with nature and our ancestors you know, who are, if not knocking at the door, patiently waiting on the other side for us to open it and admit them. But we just, for cultural, professional, legal, institutional reasons, don't do it. It's, 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 it's a great tragedy. It's a great loss. And I've said many times, I wish I had begun earlier in my life, but I am where I am now and I'm trying to make the best of it. You use an interesting term, Randy, to describe uh, uh, the way these experiences manifested themselves to you. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's visitations. Yes. And I'm, I'm more and more pleased with the words. Um, sometimes you write a book and the words come back to haunt you. But this one, um, I'm feeling um, just incredibly well, well suited to, to defend. And, you know, I, I want to make it really clear to you know listeners and to the readers of my book, you know that I do not have pretensions of being a shaman or a medicine man who can conjure at will you know ancestors and spirits of nature and and call upon them. Um, I I don't feel the need to do that because I feel they're just there waiting to be admitted you know to to complete their their visitations. And as one of my anthropological colleagues here in Vermont wrote most elegantly in a short essay, her name is Eleanor Ott, um, she's an expert on shamanism, she cautioned people who would want to be shamans that to practice shamanism outside of the constraints of a community is positively, psychologically, and spiritually dangerous. And I think there's real wisdom in that. I'm not saying people shouldn't do it. People shouldn't use meditation and other techniques to reach beyond, you know, the material realm. But for my particular tradition, um, I, I don't see the necessity to engage deeply in begging, um, requesting, putting in the long distance phone calls it's just a simple matter of listening. We started to talk about, uh, you call them the coy wolves, which is a hybrid between a Western coyote and an Eastern wolf. Uh, and uh, how they were howling and circling around your house. And, and you, you describe how as you began to pay more attention, the, the communication opened up in some way. Yes. And then I would find during times of crisis, like my mother's death, um, or other times of uncertainty when I'm wrestling with a particular dilemma, trying to write something clearly on a piece of paper, which is usually at two o'clock in the morning, that the coyotes will appear after they've been absent for a week or two. And even more than the coyotes, the, the owl, um, which makes this cuckoo hoku sound, and in my language is called cuckoo hoku, um, would visit. And it got to the point where it was so close to the house that I had the chutzpah to go out on the front porch one evening on the coldest possible night and call back to the owl, only to find that it responded. Call again, it responded. And as I stood on the porch, um, owls came from many different directions. And it was a, a collective conversation and went to sleep and woke up and wanted to reconnect. So I went out and it was one of the coldest nights we've had in Vermont. I don't usually go for walks in the middle of the night. And as I walked down the road, I wasn't connecting. So I went home. But as I entered my property, you know, the, the owl called to me and I began the conversations again and they gathered from all distances. And it was a full moon night when these things typically happen. And I, my rational intellect, you know, my university materialistic intellect clicked and said, okay, Randy, calm down, calm down. You know, moonlit night, owls looking for mice. Of course, they're active. You know, don't, don't overread this. Don't self-aggrandize. And then I 
privately, quietly said to myself, okay, so if this is something more than just owls on a moonlit night, show me something really unusual, something not as common as owls looking for mice. And I look up, looked up at the sky and it literally opened up and a shooting star flashed across the horizon. And, and, and it wasn't one of those little blips like you see in the summer that's a tenth of a second long. It was a long, scrawling um, kind of writing across the sky, the kind of thing my grandfather might do with his shaky, elderly, ancestral hand. And, and what I heard in my head was, okay, Randy, see, this is real. You asked for verification. We gave it to you. How many times do we need to tell you this? It was a really humbling experience. What you're suggesting by all of this is a kind of intimate connection, not just with the living creature, the owls, but with, uh, you have to say, uh, the immaterial world of a shooting star as well. Or I should say the material world. Yes. And to continue, you know, this connection with my grandfather, the reason I brought it up is that I have my grandfather's watch, gold watch, which he received on his way to fight in World War I, and it's under a little bell jar, and it's, it's just a thingy thing, right? It's not a living creature. And when I had a Potawatomi visitor here once, we were playing Johnny Cash's song um, about Ira Hayes, one of the people who planted the flag on Iwo Jima, one of the few who survived. And the, the song, you know, is, is truly sad. And I was making the connection to our grandfather who fought in the, you know, the white man's army, which only, you know, a few decades earlier had, you know, slaughtered the last, you know, of some of the Sioux on, on a, you know, that famous wounded knee. And, and, and I said to this person, I said, you know, the, the, I, there's a connection here. And it wasn't, and then and, and all of a sudden the watch started to tick, and not tick, I mean, but swing like a pendulum under this glass dome. And it, it shocked all of us beyond belief. Um, and it went on for quite some time. Later, after our guest left, I opened up the watch and looked at the inscription. And the inscription was the day of this event, the day that Ira Hayes landed on Iwo Jima at the beginning of this campaign the day that my grandfather is given this presentation on the way to his experience in World War I. So the, the intimate connections with my grandfather began then and extended through plays about residential schools. I, I feel more close to my grandfather now than I ironically did when he was alive because he never talked about being an Indian boy. He couldn't bring himself to talk about it. You know, it's in some ways not all that different from uh, some of my Jewish ancestors when they came to the United States, although they were practitioners of the Hasidic branch of Jewish mysticism, they would never talk about it. They tried so hard to assimilate and, and be thought of as just normal Americans. I, I understand too well, and I... I I, I wish we could go back and talk to them about how they felt giving up that that connection, or maybe in my case, as I wrote in the book, when I saw the play about being a student in an Indian residential school, I mean, I literally felt like my grandfather was sitting next to me in the theater saying, I'm going to choke up, I always do here, but basically saying, sorry, I could never tell you about this, here it is, this is what happened. Phew, at long last, you know, the secret is out. And here, another one of those astounding synchronicities. It turns out that the play was performed on the territory of where my great, great, great grandfather was born in Montreal. He was the voyageur fur trapper. And I didn't know that until long after the performance. So now I begin to wonder if my grandfather's grandfather wasn't sitting next to him, you know, holding his hand. 
Well, the history of the Indian schools uh, is, is a very uh, significant chapter in, in the life of Native Americans. I gather that uh, there was a real effort. I think you used the phrase, uh, kill the Indian uh, inside of these young children in order to turn them into Americans. That is an exact quote of the godfather designer of these residential schools, um, and he and some enlightened people of the times who actually had Indians' interests at heart, many of them cringingly were even Quakers, they felt that the only way they could salvage the Indians whom they had written off as vanishing, this is the origins of the vanishing Indian image, the only way they could salvage these people was to kill the last remaining vestiges of Indianness, cut their hair, take away their Indian names, teach them English, teach them um, mechanical vocational skills, and bring them finally at long last into the mainstream, that this was in their interest. And my grandfather went to three of those schools um, and literally spent his entire childhood from age seven or eight until he was 17, that, that was his childhood. And they, they, were, they were brutal, absolutely brutal places. To jump around a little bit, earlier you mentioned Ira Hayes, who, who was one of the uh, soldiers who raised the flag in that famous image at Iwo Jima. Uh, he was Native American. Yes, yes. Um, came home um, a war hero for a short period of time. Um, ended up succumbing to alcoholism as many Native Americans did and still do because of the stress and maybe as you alluded to, you know, the inherited ancestral stress that we just pass down sometimes from generation to generation. And he died ignominiously in a, in a ditch, um, forgotten. Also to go back uh, when, when the watch started swinging like a pendulum inside of the uh, glass uh, container where you kept it, you, you were playing an album by Johnny Cash that was sort of a tribute to the, to the pain that Native Americans had suffered. Yes, it's a ballad of Ira Hayes. It was one of Johnny Cash's favorite songs. And by the way, it was an album that he got in enormous trouble for making, Dish Jockey's refused to play it and he he literally went around and demanded it many people said johnny this is going to be the ruin of your career and it was one of his proudest moments you also talk about in in your book the way in which uh, native american culture has has become I, I guess the best word is is commercialized. That native dances were at one time uh, forbidden. They uh, through the Indian schools, the languages, the dances, the songs were all forbidden, and then uh, they came to be put on display, like in uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Yes, these these two things happened paradoxically at the exact same time. While Indians were not allowed to dance for themselves, they were paraded around the country and performed in coliseums to huge, you know, oversold crowds of white people who wanted to see Indians do what they wanted to do for themselves and couldn't. And then um, people like Black Elk went on tour in, uh, in Europe. They were absolute sensations. And when they came home, they had learned to be performed Performers, and as I try to explain in the book, I'm sure I'll get a little bit of blowback from some of my tribal members. They reinvented the powwow based on that European and theatrical performance, so that what we know today of as the powwow incorporates incorporates both traditional forms of dance and things that white people want to see. For example, everybody wearing a feather war bonnet, which only Western tribes wore. But if you want to be accepted as an Indian, you wear that war bonnet. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to recover um, an identity that has been, I guess the term would apply here, whitewashed. There are all of these 
competing cultural forces uh, that you encountered as you began to awaken to uh, not just your Native American identity, but but the deeper implications of it. I call it animism, but uh, there are many other ways to describe a kind of spiritual connection with uh, with everything. Animism really goes to the heart of it, and I, I, I think um, it's really worthy of some of our attention here because for Native Americans, even in our language, for example, our Potawatomi language, there are animate nouns and inanimate nouns, huge numbers of animate nouns. And there is the simple assumption that when I go out in the garden and plant the seeds or pick the squash or the beans, as I did today, that these are animate beings, they are friends, they are partners giving a gift. And I don't just pick it and grab it and run inside. You know, I feel that I have an obligation to say miigwech, thank you to the plant for, for this gift. When we tap maple syrup, we touch and thank the tree for the gift. Um, and I know more than one Native American who, who feels not just that obligation in a cultural sense, but actually feels the gratitude and the connectedness with the plant or the tree. The same thing with hunting. Uh, I know it's an anathema for many people in the modern culture. For Native Americans, it was a matter of survival. And when you took the life of an animal, you didn't take it to hang its head on the wall. You took it because you needed it to survive. And you asked permission before you took that life. And afterward, you gave gratitude. And when you took the meat back to your village, the same kind of gratitude was expressed. We are both predator and predated. We are prey. We are prey of viruses. And we need to be humble and understand our role in this animate universe. We are just one of many beings. We are not the top species. We, in our biology books, we may be called the, you know, keystone predator. But as I think we're learning, when our best minds cannot tame a brainless little virus, they've been around for millions, if not billions of years before we arrived. And they are our equals and our partners. They are part of this glorious living system that um, Lovelock called Gaia, you know, the living earth system. And if we disrespect it, if we're arrogant about our role in it, there's a terrible price to pay. And we are certainly paying that price for ignoring the fact that we live as just one living creature in this animate universe. The, the phrase animate universe is important because I gather that you've really come to uh, a perspective where you see uh, everything as alive. Yes. And I, I, it's, it's really hard to explain how, how altering that is of one's consciousness. I think in the first pages of my book, I have a, an image of a statue from England of Alice through the looking glass. And Alice is literally caught halfway through the look, looking glass. Um, and that freeze frame moment is now how I feel I spend not every moment, but most of every day. And it increases day by day where one foot is consciousness living in the animate universe and the other one is in this crazy really crazy materialistic world that we we call reality and they they tug at one another they they compete with one another um and i'm i'm not able um at this point or willing at this point to give up one um, and live only in the other i think if i crossed through the mirror all the way and tried living in the animate universe that I probably um, would be highly suspect as to my sanity. 
Well, the interesting thing is that for centuries, your Native American ancestors lived in that world. That was the only world they knew. And then uh, with the arrival of Europeans, uh, things have changed drastically. And you yourself are in a unique position, never having lived on a reservation uh, at all. That's really the title of your book, Without Reservation. That uh, is is a unique situation, but it represents the status, I suppose, of uh, millions of, of Native Americans like yourself who have never lived on a reservation, many of whom have spent their lives in urban centers. Yes, and the numbers are increasing, and I, in the book, discuss um, several attempts to portray the consciousness of Native Americans who are now completely urbanized. I want to back up to something you said because it's literally the um, the mental um, the struggle I've been working on for several days, and that is the notion that Native Americans were only a spiritual, not a material people. I don't think that's what exactly you meant to say. It's sort of implied. I'm beginning to develop an enormous respect for what brilliant empiricists and biologists and, you know, forest ecologists Native Americans were. And scientists are beginning to understand this. We even have a term now, TEK, tech, or traditional environmental knowledge. And we're realizing that there's a great deal of wisdom derived from the epitome of scientific observation and testing that Native Americans created and then handed down along with their animistic worldview. So part of the message I think that I feel I'm being charged to get out there, and sometimes it's taking it back to my own people, is that we need not abandon our credentials as materialistically capable empiricists in order to also argue that we have spiritual strength. They are not mutually exclusive. It's this dualism that Western philosophy and science has introduced that has victimized even Native Americans into thinking that you can't assert both at the same time. You refer to Black Elk, who was made uh, quite famous in the uh, book by John uh, Nyhart, uh, Black Elk Speaks, uh, was a medicine man and a visionary. But uh, you point out that in in his tribe, which I believe was the Ogallala Sioux, uh, it wasn't enough just to have visitations and visions. You you had to reflect on them. You had to even discuss them and 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 test them uh, with other tribal members who would question you. Yes, the process was very similar um, to what Catholics use when someone is nominated to sainthood, which, by the way, you know, Black Elk is, you know, being so nominated. Um, the family members, the parents of Black Elk, when he explained the vision he had as a young child, immediately called in the medicine man, thinking that maybe their son was crazy or that it had just been a manifestation of illness. And repeatedly throughout his life, he went through this process again and again. And this is what the Catholic Church does when they think they have a miracle. They call in the person who is known literally as um, the devil's advocate, and they have a trial. And they try to prove that what was a miracle actually was scientifically explainable. It does not violate the laws of nature. So um, poor, poor Black Elk you know, found himself stranded between two worlds and then his biographers attempted to claim either that he was a Native American who never really gave up his traditional ways, or that he was a Catholic who got rid of those Native American ways and became a full-blown Catholic. Black Elk knew that he could be both. And as I explain in the book, um, this wonderful image of a Native American who you know, was patient enough to explain this to me in print, this kind of dualism of spirit 
is is alien to Western culture, and it goes back. Excuse the excursion into philosophy for a moment. Um, you know, it goes back to this notion of the principle of identity that Aristotle had: that A is A, and A cannot be B. Or you know, a rose is a rose is a rose. You know, a rose is a rose cannot be a marigold. Of course, we know that. We have forgotten this because it's so intuitive for us now. We don't question it, but. Native Americans don't have a problem saying boy and bear, two different categories. Sometimes boy spirit and bear spirit can become interchangeable or something in the middle can happen, boy bear. So for Black Elk, he could be a Catholic of the deepest conviction, which I believe he was. And at the same time, be a Sioux medicine man of the deepest conviction. And he did not view them as impossibly contradictory categories. It's a much more m nuanced and rich view of what human consciousness is, as opposed to what intellect dictates it ought to be. You also write extensively about uh a uh, Native American uh, woman from the 17th century who uh, was recently uh, canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Yes, um, that's Kateri Tekakwitha. Um, as I point out in the book, I can see her shrine from our apartment in Montreal when COVID allows us to get there. Um, when we bought the apartment, I did not know that she would be just across the river, nor that my grandfather, Fur Trapper, would have worked just up the street. One of those many synchronicities and coincidences. But Kateri Tekekwitha um, converted, if you wish, um, to Christianity. But as her biographers, who were Jesuits, point out, her form of worship in her very brief life was to go into the forest, which she considered her church, and to, sm to make small wooden crosses and hang them on the trees. To me, that says it all. She saw no discontinuity between her former life as someone embedded in what was Iroquois or Mohawk culture and her newly found convictions as a practicing Catholic. How is it, though, that she uh, became canonized? Well, I mean, it, ha it has to do with um, some someone, some group of advocates going through this rigorous process of proving that there are two miracles. Um, and, you know, the, the, the first miracle um, is enormously controversial. Um, the historical records of her Jesuit biographers claim that this um, dark-skinned young woman um, turned lily white immediately upon her death, and this was proof that she was a saint. I think they were probably neglecting the fact that when we die, the color drains from our complexion, but I'm not going to argue that one as the, um, the devil's advocate before the Vatican. This is now water over the dam, as they say. The second miracle occurred when a young man had one of these awful facial um, infections of the multiply resistant um, bacteria and was literally near death being given the last rites. And a nun who bore the name of Kateri came in with a relic of Kateri, placed it on his pillow and he recovered. You know, that was considered to be um, a well-documented miracle in the modern world. So I often visit her shrine. Um, I have a close relationship with the people in the community um, who are Catholics and in some cases quite mystical about it. And we have very open and honest conversations about what it means to be multiply spiritual, what it means to be both skeptical and believing and it's, it's, again, it's, it's part of this complex journey, but it, it just astounds me that I look out my balcony and, you know, there, there I can see her shrine on the other side of, of the river. 
another fascinating part of uh, your story, I thought, was uh, your encounter with an Indian from India who was uh, living in Canada and uh, painting portraits of Native Americans. it's, it sort of suggests a kind of um, multiculturalism. Uh, I myself feel, for example, that we live in an era where we are all the inheritors of, of the world's cultures. Well, as you can see behind me, next to the, the painting, which symbolizes my, my tribal name, um, is a, a Buddha that I I could say I bought um, in my book, I say, found me in a flea market in China. And I, I, I am very comfortable, not just intellectually, with the similarities between different spiritual traditions. And in the case of um, Manji Chaitrik Singh, the, um, the artist whose paintings fill my house, um, we have found an enormous um, empathy with one another. And he has constantly been astounded, as as, as have I, um, with the, the, the similarities between the Sikh religion and its embrace of animism and my Native American spirituality. And his, his paintings gave me a great deal of encouragement at strength early on because they have a pride um, in the images of the Native Americans that I actually haven't seen in very much Native American art. And it, it's as if someone needed to step out of the frame of our culture and its limitations and re-enter with the the spirit of another animistic tradition to understand and then project life back into the visage of of Native Americans. And that goes back to one of your comments earlier in our discussion here about the awakening that is happening. And I do feel that our ancestors and as Lovelock says the animate ancestors of this creation we call the world um, are are desperately reaching out to us to engage us as partners in the healing and I know if you asked Manjeet you know how we met you know he would say at the drop of a hat it was destined um, and the p- perfect example of this is the last trip we made to Montreal with my mother, who just loved his paintings. We stayed at her favorite hotel, and I explained that down the street is where Manjeet had his stall, but it's gone now. The season is over. We went down the street, and there was Manjeet. He, he came to town for a few minutes to pick up his last remaining paintings, and my mother got to meet this man. I mean, he practically fainted. And as you and I have discussed, you know, some people would say coincidence and synchronicity. Manji in, understood instantly, as did I, that this was this was destined to happen. It's one of the many ways that our our life journey spirals back on itself and includes others in that that spiral. Let's talk about your mother a little more. I know that her her death was a very important part of your awakening. Uh, to to Native American spirituality. This is a theme that readers of my book and people who've interviewed me just seem to be blown away by to a degree I had never imagined. So the brief version of this is my mother had a stroke and ended up moving up here to live with us in Vermont. And it was during her residence that these visitations you know, began, um, you know, the, the, the creatures of the wild. And I, I knew at the time that they were trying to tell me something about my mother's approaching death. You have one serious stroke, another one is very likely, and the prognosis, you know, was, was not, not good. Um, but my, my elder mentors, in particular, you know, one of my cousins whom I credit in the book, Um, was very patient with me when I would send her a two o'clock 
in the middle of the night message saying, so, so Barb, this is what just happened. You know, <laughs> is, am, I, am, I, am I going crazy or is, is this something that our people have an understanding about? And she was my cultural, spiritual interpreter. And it was astounding how we would anticipate one another's emails hours before they were sent or answer the email um, you know, before it was sent. So I'm sending one and she's already sending the answer. My mother did not connect deeply during her lifetime with this heritage, but as the name she received from my cousin posthumously suggests, um, you know, she is the person who showed us the way. And, and she was, she was the, the person who, took the bolt out of the gate that kept so many of us and me out and opened and said, don't know where this is going, but pass through. Um, and I can only imagine, you know, what, what happens to her spirit, you know, what happens when she meets my grandfather's spirit and many of these unanswered questions and undiscussed and unresolved family secrets suddenly become shared memories and experiences. I like to think that my grandfather's spirit is being healed by this process um, and possibly my mother's as well and ancestors going back to the time of the settlers who first came here. One of the experiences you talk about is uh, uh, a communication with an owl and the association of owls with the impending death of of somebody. Yes, my 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 lay understanding, based on a movie I'd seen in the nineteen seventies called "The Owl Called My Name," was of a, a story of a priest, you know, Hollywood eyes, who goes to the Northwest, um, evidently based on you know some element of factual record. And he learns from the tribes in the Northwest that just before your death, the owl comes and calls your name and that's a warning that you're about to die. So the night before my mother had her second stroke, um, we went to a presentation on Native American uh, heritage. And when we got out of the car, instead of the owl being distant, you know, of a quarter mile or 300 yards, it was literally, I don't know, maybe 30 feet away in a tree, and it was deafening in its call, and I mean, it shook me. It, 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 I, I immediately interpreted it as, oh my God, you know, um, the, the owl is, is, is calling. And as I said, you know, the, the ornithologists capture this call of the owl as, who cooks for you? You know, cuckoo, cuckoo. And of course, who cooks for me? My mother. You know, so it's like, oh, my God, they're calling my mother's name. You know, she's she's not going to live much longer. In fact, she had a stroke and died shortly thereafter the next day. But Mike explained to me that the, the owl is not some kind of demon tapping your spirit and carrying you into the next world. The owls and other raptors are there as messengers and guides as you walk on through the northern gate. And knowing that made me feel incredibly comfortable. And the next day when she had her stroke and was laying on the gurney and reached out and was grasping at something she could see and we could not, it was, it was apparent. I mean, I've, I've heard these descriptions many times, but she clearly was seeing something beyond that those of us who were totally trapped in our physical bodies you know, could not see. So my, my mother, you know, has to be credited with being one of my, my teachers. Well, I guess that's part of, of, of the whole connection with ancestors, that they're even, even when they seem to be just, you know, ordinary people living ordinary lives, there, there is power in the spirit that uh, transcends death. Yes, and... One one continues to be grateful, and I'm I'm ever more grateful and anticipating and wondering, you know, what the next message, awareness, little piece of enlightenment will be that they wish to share. 
Well, Randy Kritkowski, this has been a, a very heartfelt conversation. I'm uh, indebted to you for uh, your journey and for sharing it with me and with our viewers. Thank you so much for being with me. Well, as we say in Potawatomi, miigwech, thank you. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to share this with you and, and with your listeners. And I hope people will respond. If silently, that's wonderful. If through communication, that's also to be welcomed. Take care. And for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us.